Nice to see everyone coming in for Rosa Seminar. It's um, uh, welcome to everyone and wherever you are, whatever time you're in. Uh, for us, it's 2 p.m. Uh, for Rose, it's 3 p.m. And uh, evening in East Asia, Southeast Asia, and afternoon, late afternoon in South Asia, and um, very much morning in North America so uh, and Latin America. So um, good to have you all here. And uh, today's topic is um, internationalization of higher education in the Philippines, a most important country, a country of nearly 100 million people, um, not talked about enough. Um, and, uh, and Rose is going to help us with that today. Um, I'll introduce her to you in a minute, but let me take you through the webinar protocols first. Now, remember that the webinar is recorded, and once we have our um, uh, communications manager back from sick leave, we'll be able to post it for you uh, on, on, our, on our website, and that puts it into a YouTube channel, which has been much visited in the last couple of years. Um, during the webinar, um, we recommend that you stay muted. Uh, extraneous noise can intervene uh, with everyone's enjoyment of the webinar. Um, but of course, we want you to turn on your mic if you come into the Q&A part of a discussion after the main presentation. Um, we advise you to use speaker view, which is in the top right hand corner there with where the red arrow is pointing, because that enables you to see who's speaking at any given time in the webinar. Now to join the discussion, and this is the most important part of our webinar, uh, send me a message in the chat. So your message would contain, as well as your name, which will be automatically on it, your question or your statement. And then from that, I'll be able to select you into the discussion proper, which will start round about half past or 35 minutes past the hour. Uh, and, uh, during the uh, webinar, I'll send you a message if we want to bring you into the discussion. Um, and it'll, it'll be a private message in the chat saying you're next or you're one after next or whatever. And then when I call you in uh, to come on camera, turn on your mic, turn on your camera and tell us who you are and where you are from and then give us your statement or your um your um, question. You can use the uh, the raised hand function, but we really do prefer you to uh, join the webinar Q and A by coming in through the chat mechanism. It it helps us to have the 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 question down there, um, helps clarify things, and um, also enables us to arrange the discussion in the optimum way. So, so let me tell you about today's presenter, Rosalind Edda, who received her PhD from the University of Freiburg in Switzerland. And she currently leads the strategic internationalization of Paracelsus Medical University in Salzburg. Tell me, Rose, if I pronounce that correctly. Um, Salzburg, famous city, city of Mozart, a lovely city in Austria. It's where she is right now. She's a lecturer in globalization and education and in qualitative uh, research methodologies. She'll tell us today um, about her topic, and I'll hand over to her at this point. Rose, the screen is yours. Thank you, Simon. Um, okay, so I hope you can see my slides. We can, and we can see it not yet in full screen view, but I think that's coming up. Yes, we can now yes. see that. Thank you. Okay. So um, again, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Simon, for this opportunity to present my work, uh, which is based on my dissertation um, published in January 2021 um, with the University of Freiburg. So to start, just a um, short introduction um, of my work, and then I will discuss my methodology, the key um, context, and then I will discuss my analysis and um, interpretation of the results. And then to conclude, I will um, give some thoughts about decolonization. Um, in 2015, the Commission on Higher Education released a press statement to respond to criticisms when three of the top universities in the country slipped down the QS university rankings. In it, the Commission warned against a simplistic interpretation of the results, emphasizing that engagement in the ranking games um, shape an uncritical national and international uh, 
perceptions of the quality of Philippine institutions and that engagement is a key priority that requires policy measures. Now, last year, the CHED applauded the inclusion of several Philippine universities in various ranking systems, such as uh, in the Times Higher Education World University Ranking, which the commission described as one of the most definitive lists of world's best research-led institutions. And this year, the commission takes pride in the inclusion of 16 Philippine universities in the QS ranking system in Asia. So in the last eight years, the, the country's engagement in the global higher education space has been very vigorous and very enthusiastic. The number of bilateral agreements has tremendously increased and the focus has become varied. So from individual mobilities to scholarships, joint dual degrees to capacity building um, of higher education institutions and leaders. The level of engagement is also regional so we work um, with the European Union and um, ASEAN. The Philippines also considers the UK as its key partner, particularly in transnational education. In fact, the UK through the British Council was influential in the formation of the Transnational Higher Education Act signed in 2019. Now, the academic literature on internationalization in the Philippines is still few, but it's growing. Um, majority of them, however, utilize yeah. the human capital theory oh, as their analytical framework. Uh, That's uh, reproducing the neoliberal and Western-centered discourses in and of internationalization. So despite criticisms by many scholars on epistemic colonialism and the asymmetric power relations in global higher education, there's still a lacuna on empirical critical policy analysis in the context of the Philippine higher education. And the use of critical discourse analysis is also few and far between. And my research aims to address these gaps. And to, uh, to achieve them, I raised these three questions. What discourse trends can be identified from the internationalization policy documents? How can these be discursively interpreted and understood? And how do they impact discursive practices of higher education in the Philippines? Now, my um, concepts or my conceptual framework is composed of globalization, higher education, and higher education policy. To summarize, I conceive them as, as disc discursive spaces that are rooted in a particular social, cultural, historical, and geopolitical locations. They are constructed, they are dynamic, they are emergent, contentious, value-laden, political, and also diverse. My operating system is rooted in social constructionism by Berger and Luckmann from their work, The Social Construction of Reality, where they propose the idea of how habits become routines in the forms of structures, systems, processes, identities, etc. And that routines that become established and accepted um, also become legitimate knowledge. This process of legitimacy is an essential component of a socially constructed reality and the process of and competition for legitimacy produces dynamics of power. My work is a qualitative study of discourse using discourse historical approach developed by Ruth Wodak and Martin Reisigel. And um, in DHA, discourse is language used in speech and writing as a form of social practice. In DHA, language is not powerful on its own, but it gains power through the use of people whose power depends on the position they occupy within the social structure. And as the name suggests, uh, the DHA approach puts weight on examining the links between historical context and the discourse or discursive events. Now, the process of uh, my path tracing resulted in what I call a network of policy data, and these data are related to internationalization in the country in varying scope and degree. The data I use are government documents, which are 
publicly accessible from three government websites. And what I call auxiliary policies are policies that are mentioned directly in the text or only in passing as applicable laws and regulations or as footnotes. But they're actually essential in understanding the policy trajectory. Uh, these include, for example, the Philippine Constitution, the National Development Plan, the uh, Professional Regulation Commission Modernization Act of 2000, the Interagency Committee on Foreign Students, National Security Policy, and so on. All these materials do not only contain information to be examined, what, like what do, what do they say or not say, but also they have their own spheres of influence or impact. Now, for those who are not familiar with the Philippines, it's an archipelago of more than 7,600 islands and islets in the Western Pacific Ocean in Southeast Asia. According to Ethnologue, uh, it has 175 living indigenous languages. Filipino and English are the official languages in the country. English is taught from elementary to tertiary levels. And at the tertiary level, the medium of instruction in most of the programs is English. And the Commission on Higher Education, also called CHED, is a government body responsible for tertiary and graduate education. To understand the country's internationalization policy, I have to very briefly mention some salient context. So the Philippines was a Spanish colony for 333 years and a US colony for 48 years. The UK occupied Manila between 1774 and 1776, and the Japanese occupied the Philippine Commonwealth for about four years from 1942 to 1945. So the country has a very long history of colonialism. So what I present today is only a sketch of how they made an impact on the education system. So the Spanish colonial government devised a system of ethnic stratification to determine many aspects of everyday lives, including access to education. From the onset, the Catholic religion played a central role in education. Now, to establish a basic public education system in the Philippines, the monarchy had to issue an edict in 1686 commanding the um, colonial officials to carry out all the previous laws on public ed education, otherwise they will uh, be met with severe penalty if they fail to comply. This edict and the demand from the local elites um, pushed colleges to admit students who were ethnically non-Spanish, but these colleges charge fees for their tuition. During this time, provision of training, um, especially after the post-secondary level, was inadequate, inadequate and there was preferential treatment to those trained in Spain or in Europe for public appointments. Now, from the beginning, the U.S. imperialist government used education to colonize the mind. However, the higher education system was kept underdeveloped under the purview that Filipinos were racially Black quote unquote, and I took that from um, Coloma, and, um, and that Filipinos were mentally incapable of higher learning. The U.S. established the pensionado system, which was a scholarship grant, but was only accessible to the children of the elite and middle class families. Under this program, Filipino students studied and lived in the U.S. to prepare for leading positions in the government. One of the un unforeseen consequences of the system was the labor migration of Filipino professionals in the US, uh, specifically the nurses. The demand for higher education continued and this led to the proliferation of private schools and private higher education institutions. Now the conditions didn't change much after independence. Uh, what Orata called compulsory education in reverse is actually the massification of higher ed due to public demand. Strongly linked to this is the privatization which continues up to this day as we can see on the numbers. So there are far more um, private higher institutions than public um, higher ed institutions in the country. Religious groups still play a key role and institutions that were established during the colonial eras continue to lead. 
If we look at the educational backgrounds of key government administrators and politicians, many of them had their postgraduate degrees in the US or abroad. And last but not least, labor migration became a government policy. Now, in the first stage of my analysis, I had um, to look at this sp very specific discursive events. So in 2013, the Philippine government passed the bill called Enhanced Basic Education Act of 2013, which added two additional years to the 10-year basic education cycle. Now, the Commission on Higher Education welcomed the reform, calling it a once-in-a-generation window of opportunity for the reform of country's entire education landscape. Now, this reform addresses the challenges of Filipinos when working or studying abroad because their degrees were always not considered comparable or up to the international standards. It is also connected to the, to, at that time, anticipated ASEAN economic integration, which was declared towards the end of 2015. And at the end of 2016, the country's first and key policy framework and strategy for internationalization was released. In 2019, the Transnational Higher Education Act was signed. It is the key policy document for TNE activities in the country. And another key event is the ASEAN Higher Education Space, which is envisioned two years from now, so in 2025. The roadmap for this was published during the 15th Share Dialogue Forum in Vietnam in July 2022. So these are exciting times indeed, and it'll be interesting to see if and how the ASEAN higher education space will materialize and develop. Now, in my analysis of the policy documents and um, press releases, I found four main overlapping themes or discourse trends in these instruments. So these are the discourse trend on marketization, on quality and quality assurance, on ASEAN, and on nation. Now, it is very noticeable that the idea of marketization is found in all the strands in the form of globalization, global competitiveness, market access, international standards. On the other hand, the idea of nation is wrapped in the ideas of human development, safeguarding the reputation of the country, commitment to the ASEAN integration, national interests, and national development. One very common and basic argument employed in all of these discourse trends is the argument of reality, which emphasizes the inevitable conditions that the country faces. The discourse on marketization emphasizes how the rationals of internationalization have changed from social and cultural to competition and collaboration for knowledge production. The benefits of internationalization to individuals is achieved through mobility and is linked to individual uh, to benefits to economic and uh, to the economy and to the society. Now, the ASEAN provides the immediate context for the ed education reforms in the Philippines, as I've uh, mentioned. It is the ASEAN reality within which the Philippines operates. Academic linkages, particularly those that include inter-regional student mobility, are expected to contribute to economic growth and thus bring benefits to the region. The discourse on ASEAN also indicates marketization, not least in relation to the envisioned opening of the market space and free flow of people within the region. As one of my resource persons enthusiastically mentioned, the ASEAN is our home turf. This is our space. Now, the next strand is quality and quality assurance. Now, this one is one of the most prominent and enduring discourses in the Philippine educational system. The policy rationals for internationalization are tightly linked to the policy on quality assurance issued in 2012. The policy argument is that the QA reforms are necessary to be able to reap the benefits of internationalization. Now, according to um, Chad's former chairperson, QA is the cornerstone, the linchpin that holds the country's internationalization strategies together. So QA is a requirement for internationalization, while internationalization is the modus operandi to implement the QA. Now, to illustrate, 
the CHED's mechanisms to support higher ed institutions in their internationalization efforts are based on the QA system. The, this means that the higher the accreditation status and autonomy of higher ed institutions, the more comprehensive the support provided by CHED. Now, by implication, the CHED defines who can participate in internationalization, in what scope, or in what degree. Now, overall, the discourse in quality assurance creates a narrative of permanent crisis of higher education to legitimize the CHED's control and power in relation to higher ed institutions. Now, the discourse strand on nation was the most complicated to untangle. Um, it required uh, defining the terms nation, nationalism, and nation state. Reference to the nation and national development is ever present in all the policies, and they appear in tandem with concepts such as competitiveness, human development, national interest, and so on. Now, following uh, Benedict Anderson's concept of imagined communities, um, Calhoun argues that nationalism is a modern phenomenon and is a discursive form for modern claims to political autonomy and self-determination. In light of the long colonial history of the country, I define nationalism in the context of the Philippines as the continuing project of nation building. I emphasize that this is an ongoing project filled with tensions, especially if one talks about identity and language. Nevertheless, the common thread that runs through the studies that stands that discourse, ideas, and ideologies are socially constructed. Now, this remains true in discussing the notion of nation. I borrowed from um, Ichisho and Uchelak, who explained that nations and, nation and nationalism are social phenomena, not an article of faith. And so they must be examined in view of the state of contemporary societies. They are social facts that have material and practical consequences. Now, in the next slides, I will show some text fragments to illustrate my points. So this paragraph is taken from the Commission's Memorandum Order uh, 55, um, which is the key policy document for internationalization. Here, the commitment to bilateral agreements and trade agreements are mentioned in the same breath as the commitment to national interest. Now, this is from the same document, and in this passage, quality education is linked to the need to respond to global competition, and, this, and it also discusses the benefits that internationalization brings. Now, in this um, passage, the ASEAN integration is emphasized as an expansion of the country's economic space and the challenges and opportunities it brings. Now, here, um, this is taken from Chad's policy on quality assurance system, and we can see that um, the ASEAN community is here perceived or imagined as a zero-sum space, so it either opens up opportunities or threatens the employment of graduate students even in their home country. In this text fragment, uh, it illustrates how national interest and national security is ingrained in the general principles of the internationalization policy. Now, national security is also visible in the policy guidelines involving international students and foreign higher education providers. This is an interesting aspect that has implications for engagement with international students and TNE entities. Now here, the procedure for monitoring international students is explained in detail in two different policy papers. Again, there's an emphasis on control and on national security. In its policy on transnational higher education, these specific rules are related to the practice of professions by foreigners, ownership of education establishments, employment laws, and the law on the quota of international students. On close examination of these rules, the limitations become more evident. For example, foreign nationals may practice their profession in the Philippines only if their home country has a mutual recognition agreement with the Philippine government or if the Philippines is a signatory to an international agreement, uh, like international standards for engineers, 
or the subject being taught does not require government board or bar examination. And this effectively eliminates 44 professions in the country. Now, to summarize, there are two discursive superstructures that frame these four discourse strands, and these superstructures need to be understood as dynamic forces that produce tensions not only in the policy process, but also in the policy outcomes. The idea of globalization, which subsumes marketization, is reified throughout the policy documents. The main argument is that, is that globalization and its corroborating neoliberal logic um, are the country's unavoidable reality that requires specific policy action. All four discourse strands I found are in encapsulated within this trope. And globalization is also construed as a problem space. It does not only present opportunities, but also challenges, risks, and threats that need to be managed by the state and its institutions. It legitimizes the mobilization of state power through policies that direct the Philippine higher education institutions on how to engage in internationalization so as not to compromise national interest and at the same time to be able to reap the benefits that internationalization confers. In essence, the Philippine government understands higher education as an economic tool and um, internationalization as a mechanism for producing knowledge for innovation to achieve um, national development. The Philippine government's view um, of internationalization of higher education as a lever for economic development follows the neoliberal economic ideologies promoted by supranational organizations such as the World Bank, the WTO, UNESCO, as well as the ASEAN um, regional bloc. Thus, the Philippine government's approach exemplifies what Bambega et al. call neoliberal internationalization. And the Philippine strategy implies complicity with the mainstream neoliberal discourse that limits the policy imaginary. Now, the second discursive superstructure is the discourse on national security based on imagined Filipino nation and justified by the argument of threat. The ubiquitous use of the term national interest implies that the policy framework should be understood in the context of foreign policy and international relations or in relation to the state's external environment. It is a powerful terminology that invokes an image of a sovereign nation state defending itself. Thus, I would argue that the discursive superstructure on national security is a form of resistance to discourses that question the power and authority of nation states. In other words, it serves to assert the Philippine state's political authority and legitimacy. I locate the discourse strand on nation at the heart of the national discourse on education, and the discourses on marketization, quality assurance, and ASEAN are tightly woven into the pursuit of national security. I also argue that the discursive superstructure on national security is a paradox, paradox and that it constructs internationalization as both a threat to national interest and beneficial and useful to national development. At the same time, the ideology of the nation serves two purposes. One, it legitimizes the um, neoliberal ideology of, glo of globalization and marketization. And two, it justifies the state's instruments of control. Now, the Philippines articulates internationalization of higher education in a way that accommodates or co-opts the globalization discourse. And at the same time, it resists it by attending to the country's concerns that are rooted in the nation's um, colonial history. So co-optation is done through globalization marketization, where resistance is covert and needs to be understood through the difficult concept of the nation. Now this, what I call ambivalence, is similar to what, um, for example, Simon has, uh, described as closeness and openness of the higher education space. In the Philippines, this ambivalence is a strategic mechanism deployed at strategic points. Now I would like to conclude my presentation with some thoughts on decolonization. In a post-colonial or neo-colonial country like the Philippines, it is necessary to embed analysis within its historical context. And we need to understand policy as a response to what is perceived or imagined as real, because they indeed have material and real consequences. Now, 
Here is a statement of a senior university leader on the question of colonialism or um, neocolonialism in the country. So she said, we have to learn to swim in the current. Now, this indicates agency and negotiation of one's position in the geocognitive spaces and um, in what Mignola calls as the geopolitics of power. Agency and understanding agency as Handlung's logic, as one's ability to imagine and reimagine the discursive spaces is critical. It is through agency that we can transform the spaces we occupy. But decoupling from the West as a decolonial project is very, very challenging. And one does not have to reject everything that is or comes from the West. In the case of the Philippines, it is critical to examine the ideas that are circulated and created within geocognitive spaces and what their impacts are on the ground. At the same time, it is crucial to develop and nurture indigenous, the indigenous knowledge system in different fields, so not only in arts and culture, to keep the scales balanced. The first one uh, requires critical reflection, while the second requires transforming curricula and pedagogy. So um, thank you so much. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Rose. So the long struggle to establish a Filipino national identity goes on, doesn't it? Yes. Um, and, you know, this has been ever since quasi-independence in 1945, um, finding a way that's outside the American umbrella has been very difficult. Uh, and um, what you presented to us is, um, I guess, uh, you know, that familiar combination of, um, uh, we, we see now re both realised in the present, the um, response to globalisation as a kind of near imperial construction is, you know, finding a place within the world market in effect, and a way to play the world market game to the maximum advantage, perhaps, uh, or to the advantage of those who rule the economy anyway. And, yeah. um, uh, you know, at the same time, a defensive nationalism, a feeling that if, if there's a national identity, an Indigenous identity to be nurtured, then it's necessarily going to have to be a defensive one. Um, and of course, the, the, the you know, the third ro road, which is the, to establish a proactive national project, which is, you know, global and regional, um, I guess, and, 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 you know, would allow the Philippines to take its place in, in rising in Southeast Asia as a important force and important force is still so hard to achieve. Um, and yet you see it happening, you know, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, in Vietnam, because of its great national struggle, it's been able to do that, I guess, almost automatically. Uh, Thailand's struggling a bit, but has the potential, you know, why not the Philippines? And it's a country with yeah. such a good education system in so many ways, despite its impoverishment. You know, it's it's got such good teachers, it's got such good um, spirit, I think, in, amongst families in relation to education. And perhaps that's more tr it's true of many other parts of society and many other sectors, it's not just education. You know, always a, a puzzle to us who look at the Philippines from outside. Why doesn't it escape the vice of history? You know, why does it move forward? Um, that's my question. I mean, post-1990, we've seen, you know, if you look back to 1990, you would say centre-periphery world, Euro-American world and Japan, you know, it was it was so, it was difficult. And as Wallace then said, for countries on the periphery, so-called, to rise up. And then 30 two years later, 33 years later, we say many countries have broken out of that shell, you know. Um, look at, um, I mean, the spectacular case, of course, it, it, of all is Korea in East Asia, it's the poorest country, almost the poorest country, much poorer than the Philippines in 1960. Look at it now. Um, but, you know, there's been so many others that have successfully built um, um, their state, built their nation, built their education system, built their science system, Perhaps now there's 70, 75 countries with a viable science system. It's not a Euro-American world anymore. And in the region of the Philippines, um, you know, many, many, many countries, as I said, have come forward. So what is it that holds the country back? What's the key, you think? Well, what, what I think is that it's, first, first of all, it's really political. Um, there's a saying in the Philippines, you know, whenever there's a new government, it's uh, two steps back and one step forward. 
And so when the when the uh, Basic <laughs> Education Act was was finally um, implemented in in 2013, it was against um, all criticisms and against all odds. So it was a um, signal of a very strong political will to to make reforms. Yeah. And and actually, there are still groups that are against this basic reform. They are still um, putting their cases in the Supreme Court because uh, for them, this is again, another um, you know, two years of additional load for families. So um, there's one uh, with politics. And then second is really the, the project of nation building is very, very difficult. Um, there still is a lot of struggle uh, in terms of for example, language. Uh, we keep saying that you know Filipino is the is the language, but actually it's based on Tagalog, which mm -hmm. is uh, spoken in Central mm -hmm. Philippines. Mm -hmm. And there are still a lot of um, ethnic groups who feel that they are being internally colonized. So there there's um, still a lot of struggles um, in that. And then you know we have the the southern part of the Philippines. And mm. um, although I think now the relationship, specifically when it comes to higher education, is getting better, but the center of education has always been concentrated in Manila. Yeah. And so all the other um, regions are, you know, or were neglected. So now it, it's getting better. And what I mean, when, when I was there and when I was talking to the um, to the university leaders and to the students, they really have high hopes, you know, that this will really uh, bring the country forward. And if one would look at the um, efforts that are being done by the, um, by the Commission on Higher Education, um, we can also see that they're really very, very active because they really feel like now with this um, basic education reform with internationalization and with the ASEAN economic integration. Like if they cannot make it, you know, globally, at least they should make it in the Asian region. So that well, that, that is the, the But thing. I do think that's the way forward. I mean, regional yeah. development is across the world, regions matter. And, you know, where um, uh, regions are developing, I think it, everyone's gaining benefits from that. Um, though, of course, it is always a question, as it is in Europe, you know, also, you know, the relationship between the nation and the region and how much the nation is, if you like, in, you know, incorporated into the regional project and perhaps playing a role in helping to lead it and so on makes a lot of difference. Um, but the, uh, so I'm going to ask you about the region in a minute, but um, uh, just to, to reflect quickly on language policy, and I notice we've got um, a going from Indonesia, and I'm going to bring him in in a minute. Um, I mean, Indonesia had the same problem as the Philippines of establishing national language after independence. And um, the, what Bahasa in, in Indonesia was originally a language of quite a small minority, um, but the country was quite remarkable, I think, what Indonesia mm -hmm. did, you know, in a very disparate country, more even larger, more, more islands, more mm -hmm. languages than the Philippines, um, and, and with religious differences as well as in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Was able, although although with Islam dominant, it was able to um, integrate the country through uh, Bahasa in primary education, and so you had a situation where, in about the, after about two and a half decades, the great majority of people did have national language to a degree. So, uh, and it was a language that had to learn through education because it wasn't a natural language for most people. So, and you've got a situation now, where Indonesian is sort of works, you know, as a national language. And that's a remarkable achievement. What holds Indonesia together? It's probably the language and Islam nice. and maybe the military at times as mm -hmm. well. But, you know, it's been really the language has been so important. But in the Philippines, Tagalog and Cebuano, Visayan were sort of mm -hmm. equal, you know, equally weighted. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. never really changed. And, you know, that yeah. the Tagalog's never kind of quite made it um, in the full sense of the way that uh, the Indonesian mm -hmm. language did. But there's a parallel problem in India, you know, with Hindi not really fully established as a national language and, in, and English and being in some respects still the language of the colonizer, you know, still being stronger in some, you know, across the country as an integrative force. So I think it's a very difficult issue. But um, let me, before we pass, you know, go through this cycle through the problems of, Indian, of, of the Philippines, um, 
uh, in full. Let's let me ask you about ASEAN and uh, what you know. You're quite right to, of course, to talk about the importance of the region. And it's been a slow burn, hasn't it? But since ASEAN began, it's gradually become more effective and be more developed. And in education, it's playing a larger role slowly as time goes on. Um, do you, I mean, the relationship between Philippines in education, in higher education, especially in ASEAN, is the Philippines putting a lot of effort and focus on that relationship and yes. what's coming and what effects is it having inside the country? What transformation is that is that creating? Yes, uh, that's definitely true. So there's um, a lot of focus on uh, on the ASEAN region. Um, some like bilateral agreements are are you know becoming uh, more pronounced or or improving. For example, uh, with Vietnam or with uh, Myanmar, um, which you know the the country has. I mean, of course, they they were always um, in the ASEAN, but there wasn't. Um, much of bilateral activities, but through the ASEAN integration, these activities like uh, mobilities and mm. um, you know, especially when it comes to the flow of the people, it's really increasing. Um, the Philippine government, for example, has just uh, signed an agreement with Myanmar regarding um, mm. teacher education, and um, I would also say that in you know in specific um fields like in in education or in teacher education um the the philippines feel like they could lead the way mm. because they have a lot of um experience mm. um and a lot of expertise so it's really um creating a lot of dynamics um in the country it's too exciting to you know it is it is philippines exciting. could play a leadership role in some you know, in some respects in education in the region, I, I'm not, I'm sure that's true, but from my own observations in the Philippines, um, you know, I suppose the positive side of the colonization was the Americans left behind a substantial infrastructure of high level of participation compared to the level of GDP per head. Um, and that to some extent still survives, you know, that that relatively high participation um, education system is, you know, from school to tertiary is, is still there. And, uh, yeah. and so a large teaching profession and underpaid, of course, um, and and I think mm. there was a period when you could say University of Philippines really had a shot at becoming a major research university. Of course, it was underfunded, but exactly. it has been substantially underfunded. And so we're dependent on Ateneo and La Salle and those private universities to sort of be yes. play a de facto leadership role. But they're they're not by nature going to be as as nationally uh, important as a, as a national university is. But there's still there's so much talent in the University of the Philippines system. You know, there's. It attracts really good quality people, and um, you know you always feel that if it's give, if, if the funding lifts qualitatively, then the university and its you know its various branches could be really quite significant. Um, yeah. So I don't think there's you know any reason to be pessimistic. It's just that the the spark has not lit the fire yet, and you know that brings me to my two two smaller questions. Um, mm -hmm. One is about the presidency. Um, we know it's 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 remarkable to find the Marcos presidency again. You know, after mm. all that's happened, but my impression is that since you know 1986, I mean, since then, um, only Ramos, perhaps to everyone's surprise, turned out to be a better president than expected um, in some respects. But you know, the presidency's you know over the years has not has failed to really lead um, a renaissance in education and science. Um, it hasn't been a priority. Um, and um, what's the, how do you read the current president, the Marcos Jr., as he is? Uh, how do you how do you re, how do you read his attitude to this sector? Um, well, it's a very difficult, you know, it's a very difficult topic because I think the country is really divided on uh, the presidency right now. Right. Um, it was as divided as with Duterte's presidency, but now it. You know, because um, there, there's a generational difference also um, on um, on like on this issue. But um, regarding your question, um, I, I I am still very skeptical. Um, one of the things that that I've found or you know I've I've read is that um, leaders of state and public um, state universities and colleges need to apply for 
um, foreign travels if they would like to participate in internationalization activities. So um, there, there's again a control mechanism that is that was built because there is a, like a perception that you know funds are being used for travel purposes and so on. So I, I, I really, I'm, 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 I think we still have to wait and see. Um, there is not a lot, not a lot of changes um, had been done. Thank God, because um, otherwise, you know, it will put all the efforts of the Commission on Higher Education, um, you know, back. But um, I, I just hope that there would be more support for um, for education and for higher education. Very, very politic answer, Rose. Um, the um, the other question I've got, which would probably be a bit easier to answer, is about research and science. Um, mm -hmm. And really, this is quite key to you know, to, 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 to lifting the, the role of the tertiary sector, although the research yeah. universities are such a small proportion of the totality of education, they do have this kind of flagship function and, um, and they become magnets for talent and they mm -hmm. begin to attract international talent, uh, internationalization of, of the first degree become an into tertiary in general becomes more attractive when there's, when there's something happening at the top universities and it's got a larger mm -hmm. importance than just the prestige of those institutions. I mean, you know, yeah. they, they do they do play a role. And I think that you know, in nation building, and I think that my colleagues, Jamil Salmi and, and Phil Altback have been right to say that all countries, you know, need research universities um, as they emerge, as they build themselves. Um, what are the prospects of that happening? What's the science budget looking like, you know, and, and how have and how large would a layer of research universities be in the Philippines? Well, in terms of um, research, there are also a lot of efforts being put um, in, into funding um, research. Uh, I think the the limitation is really uh, on funding, on the resources. Um, as you said, you know, there the talent is is there. Um, a lot of um, people who who have already um, also done some some research uh, or some important research, but it still is growing. It it need it needs to be nurtured um, because the, traditionally the higher education institutions in the Philippines are teaching institutions. Yes. So it is the the University of the Philippines is um, it has the mandate to do research, um, and. The rest of you know the, the rest of um, high education institutions, particularly the, the private institutions and the local universities and colleges, they're not expected to do research. So I think um, the Commission on Higher Education has to look into this because, um, for example, the quality assurance system um, defines what should be the mission of their university of a university, depending on its typology. So. Colleges, for example, are not expected to do uh, like a nationwide research. They can do research within their communities. Mm -hmm. And uh, professional institutions, like professional colleges, are you know not expected to be active in research. So this is, I think, something um, that has to really be looked into because there's a lot of uh, potential, but it's not being um, exploited at the moment. I think again, okay. Indonesia is a good, interesting kind of, you know, sort of comparison because it Indonesia was in this situation ten years ago, and it's sort mm -hmm. of taking off now. Belatedly, I mean, tertiary participation was well below Philippines level. Now it's going up quickly, and and research and science, which were really quite weak uh, in the world sense, although probably there was more mm -hmm. going on in the national language than the the global, you know, bi bibliometric system shows us. Uh, nonetheless relatively weak and now taking off and pa number of papers yeah. expanding very rapidly there so mm -hmm. the takeoff is happening in indonesia it is a little bit wealthier as you know per capita mm -hmm. um but but the same kind of problems of broad coordination so let's bring in um agang uh, negroho from from indonesia who's put two really interesting questions into the chat and perhaps the two of you can have some dialogue at this point agang are you there please 
Yes, I am here, uh, Simon. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Right, uh, I'm sorry I did not turn on my uh, camera because I think there is a, a slight internet problem in my place. I'm in Indonesia at the moment, so it's rather different than a couple months ago when I joined the uh, webinar when the internet connection was very strong in Bristol Uni. <laughs> it's a completely different situation back in Indonesia. So uh, yeah, uh, first of all, Simon, uh, thank you so much. I haven't got a chance to say this to you, but uh, I'm a, well, I finished my dissertation a couple of months ago, and then I just would like to let you know that your name is actually almost in all parts of my dissertation. So lots of your quotes and <laughs> your theories have been there. Oh, I and, do hope you found some other people with more wisdom than me to also. <laughs> I will. I will. <laughs> I will develop those dissertation into uh, some publications, hopefully in the next few months or years. And uh, thank you, Rosalind, for your uh, insightful presentations regarding the uh, universities in uh, the Philippines. I see there are lots of similarities between our countries yes. in terms of the education system and then the colonialization that happened in our countries. Yours uh, around 200 years, mine is 350 years and occupied by the Netherlands and, and Japan and Portuguese. Mm -hmm. So si similar countries have also been uh, colonized our place. And uh, yes, uh, allow me to have two questions to you. Uh, these two questions might be uh, quite against each other in their nature, because the, the one is asking about the uh, strategies or approaches of university internationalization in your in your country. And and I believe that you have answered one of the parts of the question, which is related to the research and uh, science and research, because. You, you mentioned that the, the increasing of fundings or the problems of fundings would be there to face uh, by the uh, uh, the universities in your country. And then one of the uh, possible ways to cope with this would be the probably the improvement of the quality of fundings given to the mm -hmm. universities. And then what about the networks? Like basically, um, I believe that networks would also play crucial um parts in the development of university internationalization like would there be any special approaches of universities in your countries regarding the uh the what they do or what kind of academic activities to support the development of their in this case international networks to support the internationalization agenda that would be the first would, would you like me to do the second directly uh, or? yes yes please okay uh, yeah, my second question, as I said earlier, it's, it's, it's again, it's my first question, because it's it's the second question that I have is, is directly linked to my uh, dissertation topic, which is the internationalization in Indonesian higher education context. And uh, one of my discussions is also similar to what you stated earlier, like you said about the universities in the Philippines have uh, more concentrations in teaching previously, and then... Mm -hmm. The policy of the government, uh, in in quotation mark, forced them to actually uh, change into research intensive universities. And apparently, in Indonesian context, uh, on one of my claims, mentioned that this will create a little problematic in terms of the uh, the focus of uh, academics working at universities, because they they were assigned mm -hmm. lots of classes in the past, and then suddenly they have to do research. And one of the uh, possible drawbacks that happened was that some of these academics dropped their classes. So they, mm -hmm. uh, I, would, I wouldn't say drop, they would just say like neglect their classes. So they might have five or seven classes per week, but because they, ha they have to put more focus in research, they just come to two of those classes, take turns coming to two of those classes. So basically it's more like a professional breach because they... <laughs> They were supposed to teach seven classes, but they do not show up in those classes. Instead, they have to be focusing their time, efforts to actually work on research. And then uh, what about in, in, in your country? I mean, we know that uh, they've been colonized for a long time, and then the colonization ended in 1945, something like that. And then we still see, well, until today that in fact, the neo-colonization is still happening, neo-imperialization, mm -hmm. imperialism is still happening by, you know, the universities actually, they are forced to compete in league tables, which is one that you mentioned, uh, times of education. And it's, in my research, it, it's, it's uh, I claim that, uh, my research claims that uh, 
by following the uh, Times Higher Education and the similar league tables such as QS World Rankings and, and Shanghai Jiao Tong University, uh, World University Rankings. We actually put our universities far behind the Western counterparts because firstly, one of the, I believe one of the uh, THE um, uh, metrics would be related to the number of publications and citations. Mm -hmm. And yes. my country's academics don't really speak English well, nor writing in English. So basically mm -hmm. they will have much obstacles in producing uh, international journals. And then if they mm -hmm. finally do, will they be uh, uh, many times cited by, by uh, scholars, just like what happened in Western <laughs> contexts, right? Exactly. So, exactly. Right. And yeah, and what about in yeah. your countries? Like, would there be any yeah. drawbacks of actually universities following these league tables? Well, okay. Well, thank you so much for... Um for sharing uh, your dissertation and your, your insights. Um, I just respond uh, very quickly to, uh, to the first um, question, like how networks are being used by universities. Now, um, you know, the leading universities in the Philippines are very much well connected. Um, you know, they have a very long history and uh, they have very good um, relationships with partner universities all over the country and also you know internationally um for example you know the Ateneo de Manila University of the Philippines uh, UST all of those um universities are very very much well connected and um I think it is also through the networks that they are really able to participate um in all these uh different um le let's say um fields like you know um, in research or um, in mobilities and so on. Um, network is, is very important. Um, it's just that in, in the case of the Philippines, as I have mentioned, um, the policies could be very, very um, regulative, very controlling, because it really controls who can participate in the internationalization activities. So for those leading universities, for those univers universities who are already doing good, they get a lot of support. But for universities who are, at, for example, who are not, you know, um, autonomous or who do not have as much centers of excellence or centers of developments, um, they are pigeonholed into um, you know a, a certain category and they only get support for example um, in terms of internationalization at home but that is also very limiting because um, they do not qualify for um, you know for example establishing uh, transnational activities or accepting international students so it's 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 very very um complicated but i also understand the position of ched because the quality of the the higher education system could really vary from very good to very bad and so somehow there should be a control but i just see a problem in the way that support mechanisms are designed and distributed by the commission but networking is uh, definitely uh, very important it's it's critical um, you know, especially in terms of, um, you know, um, um, knowledge exchanges. Now, the focus on uh, research and the pressure that is um, giving to academics, I would say that in the case of the Philippines, um, these changes are coming very slowly. Um, as I've said, um, in you know, it really depends on the mandate of the university. It depends on the type of the university. Um, so for those universities um, that are expected to do uh, research, uh, they can, and they also get incentives. So that is one way of, you know, um, keeping them motivated. Um, on the other hand, again, um, as you've mentioned, you know, there's a problem of um, time um, and resources. So I would say that these changes are coming in very slowly and we still have to really observe um, how it's going to develop and, you know, what kinds of problems and issues that the academics will, will really face 
um, especially when it becomes institutionalized, because right now they are expected to do research, but um, it's still voluntary. So that would be my short answer. Well, um, thank you both for that. Um, good sustained discussion. Again, is there anything else you wanted to ask at this point before we move to a close? Um, no, thank you, Sam. I think that'll be that'll be uh, that'll be all. Uh, that, that's a very great answer, Rosalind. That will yeah. be insightful for me. I can understand very yeah. much about the situation in in Philippine context. Yeah, it's been really helpful, Rose. The whole webinar has been very informative for us. Let me ask you one more question um, before we close. This is a kind of controversial one as well, but I won't ask you about the presidency again. I promise. Um, the China-US tensions, um, uh, how are they playing out in the Philippines, which is kind of, you know, pretty close to the front line of the, uh, mm -hmm. you know, of the Pacific tension and, um, and of course, has significant Chinese population and, uh, and, and mm -hmm. Chinese students will be coming in, and I guess, in a few in a few cases, as well as Philippine students going to China, as well as the US, as they, of course, always have. Mm -hmm. um, how's that, how's that affecting internationalization? Um. Let me put it this way. I think um, the Commission on Higher Education is trying to be neutral in this case. Mm -hmm. But in, in the Philippines, in the Philippines, there's really a lot of tensions, especially yeah. during the Duterte presidency. Um, the, because um, it's, it's not just about education, but for example, you know, um, labor migrants coming to the Philippines, mm. um, unskilled um, labor migrants, uh, and and that was uh, that really created a lot of um, public debates on you know the the role of China and also what is the role um, or what is the relationship really between China and the Philippines, and um, so it 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 had a lot of tension, and the Commission on Higher Education. I think um, has not really um, made any statements against or for the Chinese because um, for them as they will enter into bilateral agreements if and when they see that it you know it serves the national interest. So um, there is uh, of course a, a, a relationship with with China. Um, and you know some Chinese um, institutions, but not as much as, for example, you know, with the U.S. or with with other um, with other countries. So yeah, these issues will run and run. Um, exactly. You know, in our lifetimes, I think we'll we'll still be, you know, for a long time to come, um, trying to work our way through this. And the Philippines is particularly like Vietnam, you know, placed in a particularly sensitive geographic location. Exactly. Oh, and so I, I think the, the commission really tries to, you know, to do a balancing act, you know, be, yes. be, between these political tensions and, you know, because internationalization should also be about collaboration and cultural understanding. So it's trying to balance that. It wouldn't it be nice if the principal players would, would move back to re-engagement instead, uh, instead of conflict? Um, wouldn't that be a exactly. better world? But I think it's beyond the capacity of third, third parties to really influence that situation of the, the big fish have got to find a way to a different geopolitical alignment themselves um and uh exactly. that's going to take some time uh these things seem to go in very long cycles you know 10 or 15 or 20 year cycles exactly. that is 30 year engagement between the us and china as a yeah. result of the you know the them both sort of being a loggerheads with the, what was the soviet union originally and now of course with yeah. russia as a you know in a, in a different place I mean, that could be the wild card that changes the alignment again, but we'll see. Um, exactly. Uh, the Philippines can't do much about it and just has to deal with it as it as it arises, I think. Well, that's been great. I mean, it's just such an important country. Um, and as I said before, so much talent, so many people who contribute to the world, higher education and education scenes, so many high-quality educators from the Philippines in the post-war period, mm -hmm. and that continues, and you're certainly part of that diaspora i think and um it's been very valuable to have you with us on our webinar um please Thank feel you. free to come again um you've given us your dissertation research which was 2021 and that was really well done um but if you've got more current stuff that you'd like to talk about 
in future. Please do come yes. forward with another webinar proposal, Rose. Definitely, I will. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you all for staying to the end. And uh, next time we've got, um, we're back in Southeast Asia, um, this important region. Um, and it's so important in our webinar, in fact, because many people come in from, many participants come from Southeast Asia. Um, and, uh, you know, next next time we've got Jimmy Steff, who's actually a, uh, a French scholar who's done a piece of work on dynamics of internationalization uh, and particularly reconfiguration of training in the making of elites, as he calls it, in Singapore and Malaysia. So we're into the Straits of Malacca next time and um, look forward to seeing you all then in two days. Um, and, uh, and once again, Rose, thanks very, very much. And to everyone, bye for now. Thank you, Simon. Thanks, everyone.